When I was at school, my headmistress used to tell us girls that we could be anything. Be anything. Be anything. It turns out she didn't mean we could be anything. She meant we could do anything. She was talking about our career. We could be doctors, we could be scientists, we could be lawyers. Whatever it was we chose, we must aim high. So much of our school life becomes about making sure we leave with good qualifications so that we can get to a good university, so we get a good first job, so we get that career off to a great start. Sound familiar? And can sound exhausting. And that's what I did. I left school with good exam results. I went to Cambridge, read economics. I got a job in finance at a top firm. And now I work in strategy and an international charity working on girls' rights. But is that who I am? What? If I lost my job, then who would I be? Where is the bigger picture in all of this? There must be more to life than all of this studying and working, right? How can we feel truly connected to ourselves and the world around us? Well, spiritual intelligence is about making these greater connections. It is a term coined by Harvard academic Dana Zohar, referred to by the Financial Times as one of the world's greatest management thinkers. Spiritual intelligence is about making greater connections, understanding a deeper purpose, seeing a broader meaning, knowing our core values. It is not about any particular religion. It is about the intelligence of the soul. There is a motivational poster hanging up in one of Facebook's offices saying, everything eventually connects. Spiritual intelligence is about seeing these greater connections, although that's probably not quite what Facebook had in mind. Exploring our spiritual identity can help us connect with something greater. And there are many names for what we call this something greater. A being, energy, light, creator, God. Pascal, a 17th century thinker, whom I'm sure many of us will remember with fondness from our maths lessons, learning about his triangle. Such fun times. Pascal concluded from his work on maths and philosophy that there is a God-shaped hole in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing. I'm thinking, what about the heart of every woman? I'm sure he meant that. Too. And Dr. Andrew Newberg, an American neuroscientist, he's conducted brain scans and suggests our brains are actually built this way. His brain scans are on all kinds of people, in prayer and in mindfulness rituals. Buddhist monks, Franciscan nuns, Sufi mystics. And he has found evidence to suggest that there are universal features of the human brain that make it easier for us to believe in and connect with something greater. So exploring our spiritual identity can help us connect with something greater. It can also help us connect with those around us. In our immediate neighbourhood, our churches, our mosques, our temples, prayer rooms, meeting halls, neighbours, or our wider community, people, people wherever they are. And we can feel connected by some sense of spirituality and by kind actions towards others. So exploring our spiritual identity can help us feel connected to something greater, connected to others. But what about ourselves? What can it do for us? Well, many people find it can help them cope better with stress and anxiety. It can help them find a bit more peace in their hearts. It can help them want to give back to society, to learn from adversity, to have courage of their convictions. <coughs> it can help them feel like they belong, like they are coming home. Now home, as we all know, is a place of more than just the occasional argument. It's also a place where we never quite know what's going to happen. But it's a place where we return to over and over again. It's a place where we belong. 
My own journey of exploring my spiritual identity began while I was a teenager at university. I had always had some vague concept of something out there greater than myself, but I wanted to use some of my time to explore that bigger picture, what was the point of all of this studying and working. So I explored further into the concept of faith overall, and then I looked into several religions. I had come across Islam, and I had come across Muslims. I had seen good examples of Muslims and some really bad examples of Muslims. And so I explored Islam, <coughs> expecting to dismiss it. As you may have figured out, that didn't really work. I found that for me, Islam ended up giving me a deep and direct sense of a connection with my creator. It also gave me a sense of connection and absolute equality with man and woman from the beginning of time and everywhere, everywhere in the world. And Islam gave me some broad practical actions, some guidelines to help really make those connections happen. Actions like prayer, like charity, like compassion for others, actions that are found in so many ways in different faiths. There are many connections between them all. So I found that for me, Islam felt really natural in my heart. It was making a lot of sense in my head. So my head and my heart were moving in the same direction. And I believe that my creator knew everything. He knows our thoughts and our feelings. So I felt that in order to be true to myself, I actually had no other option but to become Muslim. So at age 19, that's what I chose. The journey itself was a roller coaster and not a fun kind. It was emotional and often intensely lonely. The journey was made harder because Islam had very bad press at the time. Still does. But I made a decision nevertheless to become Muslim. I still am. I felt it was worth it to feel like I was coming home. Now, I felt I was coming home, but it probably wasn't a home that my parents initially recognised. As family, we often need time to accept the choices of those closest to us, whether that is someone's choice of job or career, their choice of spouse or life partner, or indeed their spiritual choices. We want what is best for those closest to us. We want them to be happy. We want them to be normal. But what sometimes we fail to realise, at least to begin with, is that what might make us feel happy and normal might not be the same for others. Some people need to change in order to feel happy, in order to feel their own version of normal, in order to return to their natural self. I was reminded of this at a work dinner I went to a few years ago. I was sitting at the teetotal end of the table, along with a Baha'i colleague and a Hindu one. There was a lot more noise happening at the rest of the table. <laughs> you can perhaps imagine, and as the evening wore on, I got up to say my goodbyes. I went around the table, and one guy, Ben, suddenly got up. And he got up and he gave me a really big embrace. Now you may know that Muslims don't really tend to go in for big hugs with people of the opposite sex who are not our family members. So this for me was really awkward. And I looked at him. And I saw in his eyes, there were tears. He was crying. And he said to me, you have always come out with what you believe in, in front of everyone, and even in front of your parents. I've never felt able to do that. My parents still don't know. And I realised he was talking about being gay. 
People in the department had wondered if he was. Ben was in his 30s and he never felt able to tell his parents how he was living his life. And he finished by saying, you and I have so much in common. Until that time, I had always thought that, in the UK at least, it was far more acceptable to say you were gay rather than Muslim if you were faced with having to choose between the two. But Ben's comments made me realise that for families, living with the way those closest to us are living their lives can be just so hard. But if we want to maintain our close relationships with our nearest and dearest, we have to accept them for who they are. I was listening to an interview with a transgender woman a few months ago on the radio, and what she said really resonated. She said, if you were a parent and you have a child who felt something was off their whole life and they became who they are meant to be, surely that should be a cause for celebration. Perhaps it's too much to ask that families celebrate the changes of those closest to them, but at least let's accept them. How an individual responds is how an individual responds can be very different to wider society. And how society responds can change over time. In the UK, what is actively rejected and even criminalised 50 years ago can be accepted now. Let's extend that acceptance to spiritual choices, to spiritual identity. And let's move beyond acceptance. Let's move to understanding. Let's move to connecting, to looking deeper, to not generalizing. You saw a picture of me at my wedding when I was a mere 21, wrinkle free. You might notice, or you might not notice rather, that I was Muslim. You wouldn't know I was Muslim and had been already for two years. And yet, if you saw me just two hours later, you might notice something rather different. You see, that was a pivotal moment for me. That was the moment of the wedding service. And that was the moment that I chose to wear a scarf. And I have done from that moment forward. A leader of an international feminist movement has said, Muslim women, they say they're not oppressed, but in their eyes, it's written, help me. I wonder, would she say that about the Queen? I chose to wear it because it was about reflecting who I was on the inside, my belief and my character, reflecting that on the outside. Since that day, the main question I get asked by people who ask anything is, uh, does it get hot wearing that? We live in England. It rains and it rains and it rains and it makes a great portable umbrella my hair dry. But seriously, we rarely ask each other a much more important question. Why? Why do you believe what you do? All of us are like icebergs. 90% of who we are lies below the surface. If we want to truly accept, we need to look deeper. Let's connect. Let's not generalize. And I'm guilty of generalizing too. Just a few months ago, I was having supper at home with my three teenage children, and the doorbell rang. I grabbed my scarf, put it on, answered the door. It was a salesman. He greeted me politely with a well-rehearsed patter, selling me the usual kind of kitchenware, tea, cloths, dish towels. I tried my best to find something to buy, but really, it was all overpriced rubbish. I couldn't find anything. Anyway, I was very polite with him. I let him know I couldn't buy anything. And then he flipped. He totally flipped. He said to me, You bleeping immigrant, I'll leave you to fill in the gaps, I'm sure you've got a vivid imagination. You don't have the right to live in this bleeping country. Go back to where you bleeping came from. And he carried on, swearing at me, cursing, aggressive. I managed to close the door. He carried on behind the closed door. I consulted the founder of all knowledge, Google, 
who advised me to phone the police. So that's what I did. They came round that evening, they took a statement. They told me it was a race crime. A race crime, we were both white English, but they said, this is not about facts, it's about perceptions. He perceived you as a different race because of your scarf. I discussed the whole incident with my children, who are finding this a way more entertaining way to spend their evening than doing their homework. <laughs> and uh, to my surprise, they leapt to his defence. They said, well, one said, Mommy, he said he's got two children to feed. And one said, Mum, he's probably just having a hard day. And one said, Mum, you mustn't generalise about all salesmen. I was livid. These are my kids, they never take my side. <laughs> but at the same time, well, actually later, on reflection, I have appreciated their willingness to try to understand, their willingness to try to connect, to look deeper. So to sum up, I would like to invite you to explore and to connect. Let's recognise the importance of exploring the bigger picture in life. Just like it can make us feel so great when we find the right career for us, which we enjoy, which aligns with our values, which uses our skills, which allows us to flourish, to grow, to contribute. So it can feel like that on a much greater scale with our spiritual identity, a place where we belong. T.S. Eliot said in his great philosophical poem, The Four Quartets, we shall never cease in our exploration. And the end of all our exploring, we shall arrive where we started. And we shall know the place for the first time. He says we shall arrive where we started. We will return, come back home, back home to our natural self. And as well as exploring, let's connect. Let's connect in our hearts with those who look different. The next salesman may indeed be genuine. The scarf-wearing woman, well, she may be the queen, but assuming she isn't, that woman may or may not be oppressed. She may be an expert in her field. She may be deeply in love. We just can't know by looking at someone. Research by the UK Social Integration Commission shows it is when different people from different backgrounds meet and mix and truly get to know one another. That trust grows and communities flourish. So let's be doctors, lawyers, scientists. But let's explore and connect, look further and deeper. And we may just discover who we really are. Thank you.